everybody. My name is Larsine. I'm a very, very grateful member of Al-Anon. And I want to thank you very much, Jane and Glenn, for the invitation to get to come. And um, uh, Brantley picked us up from the airport, and, and Lisa and Chris and uh, Tony, who sent me emails all the time, and Paulette, who sent me cards and notes. I mean, the hospitality here is beyond. You know, I love the hospitality of this part of the country. I think everybody could learn a lesson from you guys. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable. And, and thank you for making me and my husband feel so welcome. Um, it's just a real honor and a privilege to get to be here and of course all the speakers that you've had you know and that you're going to have I mean you have some of the best that AA has to offer and I'm an expert on it because I go to lots of AA meetings and um, you know and Charlie and Katie are very very dear to my heart and uh, um, and I appreciate Charlie's appreciation of Al-Anon. Um, it took I had to hit him a couple of times but he's finally getting it and uh, <laughs> And, um, and then Bill, who, um, you know, we talk about Bill, you know, because, because Bill really did almost die. He is not BSing nobody from this podium. I mean, we all saw him and thought, man, this is, this is scary, scary stuff. And even after he got his liver transplant, it was even scarier, scarier, because he had, you know, as an alcoholic, you just never accept a gift easily, you know. It's always got to be a fight, you know. And, and so... Uh, and he got a new liver and his kidneys were pissed, you know. I mean, it's just so typical of an alcoholic. And uh, you just can't get a new liver and be happily ever after. No, no, no. So, um, but anyway, you know, that he sits with us here today is just um, as an answer to God's prayers for a lot of people. And, um, and I've known Bill for a really, really long time. I know both of Bill's wives. And, um, and one thing I'll tell you about Bill, he's a good wife picker. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not anything else, but he's a good wife picker and uh, because he has had two remarkable women in his life. And I also got to go to meetings with Bill's mom, who was a remarkable member of Al-Anon, and it's one of the reasons that I get to stand before you today. So anyway, um, I just need to say that. Um, you know, it's always really scary and intimidating being the only Al-Anon speaker at an AA conference. I liken it to being the corpse at an Irish wake. Um, <laughs> No one expects you to say much, but they can't have the party without you. You know, I mean, it's just the... Token Allen on slot, yeah. That's it. You know, this is, I always talk either in Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, usually during the golf tournament, you know, because that's just how that goes down. And, uh, you know, and I come to these conferences, you know, and it's Alcoholics Anonymous, and then a little tiny print with Al-Anon participation, which always pisses me off because it's like, boy, when you're in jail, you want Al-Anon participation. Yeah. yeah. Who are you going to call then? I'll tell you who you call. The only people you know that actually have money, okay? Yeah. You know, I'm sorry, we all can't be alcoholics, okay? Some of us have to just run the world until you finally get sober and take your rightful place as ruler of the universe. So, uh, <laughs> we're doing what we can do here. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to joke about AA and all that kind of stuff because that's what I've learned in here. Laughter, you know, takes the pain away. It's a very, very, very healing thing for the family, I believe. And, and I've learned to laugh with you guys. I mean, and I am so, so grateful. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't say enough about what I think about AA. Um, you know, it saved my husband's life. It saved my son's life. I am so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. It has saved my life. And, uh, and I am not an alcoholic. I identify so much with all the speakers when they're talking about the steps and they're doing that. All of that applies to me. I identify. I identify with all the feelings. The only reason that I'm not an Alcoholics Anonymous is because I don't drink. I just can't get past, you know, I'm just not into it. I just, you know, no, I don't care. I'd rather have a pickle than drink, actually. You know, I mean, if you ask me, that's just how it goes down. Other than the obsession for the drinking part, you know, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. But I'm not going to stand before you today and tell you that I know what it's like to be an alcoholic because I don't. I do not understand the compulsion to drink. I don't understand the allergy. I don't. It's not my experience. And I don't need to know that. I just need to know that it actually happens. And I've witnessed it in my husband and my father and my sister and in, you know, um, my husband. I, I know that it's a real deal here. But, it, but I am not an alcoholic. I do not understand. I'm not going to talk about that. You know, I've been tasked to talk to you about the family afterwards. You know, and when I look at the, you know, 
you know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I read, you know, in our Al-Anon literature, it says you should learn all you can about the disease of alcoholism. It is clear about that. And the only place I know to learn all I can about the disease of alcoholism is in open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and by reading the big book of AA. I tell all the people that I sponsor in Al-Anon, you need to read the big book. If you're going to deal with alcoholics, you need to read the big book because it's like the owner's manual, okay? If you want to know what's going on here. I mean, I read this sometimes and I'm like, holy crap. And, you know, when my husband first got sober, you know, he says, oh, you I wasn't going down and on. He goes, you need to read the chapter to wives and the family afterwards. That's what they told me, you know. And so I read the chapter to wives and the family afterwards gag me with the spoon, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Just being honest, all right? It's just like, you know, and, and I'm pissed too. Chapter 8, that's where we come in? Chapter 8? I mean, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's, uh, we just barely beat out the employers. Thank you very much for <laughs> including us at all. And, uh, you know, and again, attitude is everything here. You know, I didn't want to read anything that was going to help me in this book. I don't care. This is your book. You know, you read it. You, you're the one that needs help. And, uh, you know, I am the good guy here. And, uh, you know, and any chapter that starts out with, you know, um, like in the... You know, the family afterwards are woman folk. Okay, I'm gone already. I'm out. You know, sorry. Yeah, woman folk, this buddy. And, uh, you know, they have suggested certain attitudes. Yeah, like, shut up. You know, do what I tell you, and we wouldn't even have to be here. Because my husband is really, really big at reminding me that if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. And then I've learned in Al Anon, well, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't freaking need to be here, dude. So, I mean, but again. But that's the, you know, the relationship that starts in the family disease of alcoholism, and, um, and it's just the absolute craziness. You know, and I remember reading this book, and I had such a hard time with those two chapters for a very, very long time. You know, and, and, and I know that Lois really did want to write those two chapters, the chapter of the wives and the family afterwards, you know, especially the chapter of the wives. She really wanted to be the, the person, and I know she was hurt that Bill did not ask her to do that. And, um, but again, however that all plays out and why and whatever, uh, you know, is, is the deal. But when, I, when I'm reading that, what it, re what it reads like to the family person, it's like, you know, it talks about, you know, our deepest, darkest path can be our biggest asset. And then like a paragraph later it says, but if your husband's had an affair and cheated on you, don't bring it up because it might upset him. Oh, we don't want to do that now, do we? You know, and... Uh, you know, and then all this, like, it didn't upset us, you know, but I guess we don't want to upset him. And, uh, and that's just what I keep reading. Don't rock the boat. Be nice, no matter what he does, no matter, you know, and there's a, you know, if he drinks, you know, like, you know, cheerfully try and help him get, you know, it's okay, no big deal. Yes, it's a big deal. And, uh, but again, my emotions and where I'm coming from. And like I said, I wrestled with this for a long, long time. But then when I got, um, to the back of uh, the family afterwards. And I, you know, and one more time, and when I wrestle with anything and I have a question about it, you know, you know, and it's, it has been shared so much about here, you know, it's about, you know, think about it, you know, pray about it, you know, and I think answers come when, when, when you do pray about things. And, um, and at the end of the chapter, let me get here. Um, Oh, the end of the chapter to wives is actually where it is. It says, we realize that we have been giving you much direction and advice. We may have seemed to lecture. If that is so, we are sorry, for we ourselves don't always care for people who lecture us. But what we have related is based upon experience, some of it painful. We had to learn that these we had to learn these things the hard way. That is why we are anxious that you understand and that you avoid these unnecessary difficulties. And when I read that, this is why we are anxious, you know, that you understand. You know, what I really kind of got out of the thing, and I think that Bill was really trying to say, is that, you know, it's hard to get sober. It's hard to stay sober. And if there's any way you can help us, you know, because back in the day, you know, they, did, they, they could barely get 100 people together. You know, and so that's kind of really what I take away from that. It's difficult to get sober, you know, and stuff. And I think he's just really asking the family, just help us in any way that you possibly can. You know, and I can accept that, you know, because that's, you know, again, that's the truth. You know, but, but when he starts out, you know, in the, you know, especially the chapter to wives, 
you know, again, I'm reading it, you know, and, you know, we wives of Alcoholics Anonymous, we would like you to feel that we understand as perhaps few others can. It's a good piece. We actually included that in al -Anon literature. But he's not a wife of an alcoholic. And that's why sometimes these chapters are hard to go down because, you know, as the book says, you can't transmit something you, you haven't got. You know, so unless you've been the wife of an alcoholic and that part of it or the daughter of or the husband of or whatever that is, you don't know what that feels like. And it is very, very painful. You know, I'm the oldest of four kids. My dad was a master sergeant in the Army. I grew up with a lot of discipline. I grew up with, a, you know, my dad raised our family just like he raised the Army. We had little Army bunk beds. We had foot lockers at the end of our bunk beds where we stored our stuff. You know, my dad did room inspection every week. We had army blankets on our bed. My dad would pop a quarter on it. I remember standing at attention at the end of my bunk, waiting to get the salute from the Sarge, you know, and, uh, and just the way that it went down in our house. And I loved it. I love discipline. I love organization. That's all the kind, it, it's, a, it's a big, big deal to me. And, um, and it works in my life. I like knowing what you want me to do, how you want me to do it, and therefore that I, you know, and I can perform and, and do those things. And, uh, and you know, my dad was also alcoholic. I had no idea my dad was alcoholic. It's not like you're born and you get this certificate that says, hey, this is what's going on, or pamphlet, you know, that, hey, too bad, your dad's an alcoholic, so start going to Alateen as soon as you possibly can. You know, there's, you know, it, my dad's just alcoholic. I don't know that he is. I just know my dad drinks every day. My dad gets drunk every day, and my dad's a mean drunk. He's just an angry guy when he's drinking. And, um, and I have no idea what that's all about. I used to wonder as a little kid why someone would go to all the trouble to marry someone and you know, just to yell at them, you know, to have kids, and then just to yell at everybody and scream at them and hit them and make them feel bad about who they are. What the heck is that about? I didn't understand any of it. But again, I don't know anything about the disease of alcoholism. All I know is my dad's a mean guy. As a little kid, I don't even, I don't even tie it to his drinking. You know, because it's just the way it is. Because my dad drinks every day. My dad gets drunk every single day. My dad likes to hit us every single day. It's just what he does. So I just think that that's just what dads do. Because we're always living in military homes with other military families. And believe you me, there are lots of moms that are walking around with broken arms and black eyes and no one ever says anything about it. So it just becomes normal behavior. It's where the insanity starts, how I start being affected by the family disease of alcoholism, even though I am not an alcoholic. You know, and I have no idea about any of this stuff that's going on. And when I was really new in Al-Anon, I went to lots of open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Again, I can't recommend that enough. Um, you know, I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous that, you know, they weren't drinking at me. You know, I, that's where I learned that kind of a thing. That's a big relief. It's a huge relief. And, uh, you know, it was one of those very first AA meetings I was at. I heard the AA speaker that night. He talked about alcoholism, the family disease. And he described alcoholism, the family disease, as like having a rhinoceros in your living room, but everybody pretends it's a coffee table. And if I have to describe the house that I grew up in, boy, that's the house that I grew up in. You know, because my mom, you know, she would always know when my dad was ready to have an alcoholic explosion, which isn't hard because he had an alcoholic explosion every day. It was just a matter of when it was going to happen. You know, my mom would sit at the table and speak to us facially, you know, because if you grow up in an alcoholic home, any form of verbal communication is the first thing that goes out the window. And when you're at the dinner table and your mom's looking at you and she's like not speaking, but she's going, you know, you know what that means. It means, like, you know, nobody talk, nobody speak, just look down at your plate because your dad's going to blow. You know, but it's one of us kids would do some minor infraction, a pee would roll off your plate, you could scrape your knife, it didn't matter, my dad would go nuts, ballistic, dinner would go flying, everybody gets a beating, everybody has to go to bed, five o'clock in the afternoon, mom, kids, the dog, we all go to bed, because that's just the way it goes down in our house. The next morning I'd have the courage to get up and go down the hallway to go and uh, get breakfast before I went to school in the morning, and there would be my dad drinking his breakfast beer. And no one said, gee whiz, Dad, what was that about last night? Gee whiz, how come you had to hit everybody? How come you had to break everything? Because the rhinoceros just goes back to being a coffee table again, and you hope today will be different. Because, boy, that is the banner call for every family, every you know, family that's living in the disease of alcoholism, is you hope today will be different. You know, that's just the deal here. And, um, you know, I need to let you know that my dad ended up dying when he was 55 years old. He died the death that they talk about in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, total insanity and death. Um, I can't even tell you the last words my dad said to me because they were so vile and so vulgar. You know, I wouldn't even begin to repeat them from this podium. And I always say the last words my dad said when in reality I know those are the last words my dad's alcoholism said to me. Because now when I can, now that I can look back, you know, at that particular day, I can remember my dad being in that bed and my dad was over six foot tall. 
but when he was in that bed, he was probably 140 pounds, maybe. His eyes sunk back in his head. I mean, just totally, just an absolute wreck. And just before alcoholism took the life of yet one more person, it spit out the last crap words it could before it took the life of yet another person. And that's the disease of alcoholism. So I know those are the last words my dad, alcoholism, said to me today. And, um, and I had a lot of issue with my dad. And I like to tell you, me and my sisters, we were, you know, that we were sad my father had died. Heck no. My sisters and I were like in the, in the hotel lobby, like, ding dong, the witch is dead, da da da. And I don't tell you this story because I'm proud of it. I tell you this story because this is where the family disease of alcoholism will take a family. That you're glad to see someone die just so you don't have to live with that fear and that horror and that crap that goes on in your life day after day after day. It's the family disease of alcoholism. But what I'm here to tell you is that what happened that day is the alcoholic died, but the, but the ism was alive and well in me and my sisters. How we'd been affected by the family disease of alcoholism. Because if my dad had just died and that was the problem, then it would just be fine. It would be over and we could just move on with it. You know, but what ended up happening for me is, you know, is that, you know, when my dad died, my dad died in 1981, October uh, the 13th, on uh, Friday the 13th, because that's the day my dad would pick, you know, and that's the day he died, and, because uh, he was just that guy, and I, and I, and I had started coming to Al-Anon in June of 81. So, you know, June to October, I wasn't anywhere at all in the loving and kind, forgiving. None of that stuff was going on. I wasn't doing any of that in my program. I was very new in Al-Anon. You know, I was still checking it all out. So, but, but I was going to Al-Anon. I'm going to the meetings. I've got a sponsor. I'm doing what they tell me to do. And I'm doing all this stuff. Why? Because when I sit in a meeting, for whatever reason, even though I don't believe a word I'm hearing, I know I'm hearing the truth because it's the only time I ever feel comfortable. I just know I'm hearing the truth. I don't like it. I don't think it applies to me, you know, and I don't, you know, but I, I know I'm hearing it. That, that's the only explanation I can have for why I kept coming back. And, um, but I was coming back and I was trying to do it. I was working the steps, working with a sponsor, doing this stuff. And now my dad's dead and, um, you know, and uh, so I'm, I'm in Al-Anon a little bit here and I'm working the steps and, you know, but it doesn't seem to matter, boy. You know, somebody says something, looks at me funny, you know, does some kind of anything. And it doesn't matter, whatever. It triggers, you know, here we go with the trigger thing. You know, it just makes me remember something in the past, some humiliation, you know, because my dad was just really, really big on that. You know, I tell people, you know, that if you've ever had a drunken dad show up at a school function when you're getting an award, I'm here to tell you that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization isn't just reserved for the alcoholic. And my dad was really big on humiliation and embarrassment and doing those kinds of things. And uh, you know, somebody would say something to me and I would remember one of those incidents and I would get so angry and so pissed off all over again. He's dead, but it doesn't matter. I'm just as mad as I've ever been. And, um, and I don't know how you are, but when I'm mad and pissed off, I like to take that home and share it with my husband and my children and the people that I love and care about the most. Because that that's the family disease of alcohol, you know, manifesting itself, you know, the best way it can. And if you can involve the neighbors, yay, for you extra points you know I mean it's just suck everybody into this suck hole of misery as much as possible I don't know what it is about that disease that demands it but you know it's just that's what goes on and um, and I didn't want to be doing it I'm going to the meetings you know I'm learning about recovery I'm hearing your stories I wanted I want to have this in my life I just don't know how to turn it off and I don't know how to turn off the anger. And, and I remember going to my sponsor, God, I just, I, I don't want to be doing this. And I'll never forget my first sponsor, Jeannie, just the best person in the universe. And uh, she came up to me, you know, and I was talking to her, and I just don't want to be doing this, Jeannie. And, and it, what can I do to help me, help me? You know, and I remember her telling me, you know, Larsine, you've done the steps, I have no question. You've done the inventory stuff, we've done all that work. She says, but al isn't about problems. al is about a solution. You know, and unfortunately, the family disease of alcoholism wants me to constantly focus on the problem instead of what the solution is. Instead of the solution that's in this book, you know, that'll show us a better way to live. But you got to, as everybody has said, you just, are you willing to look at it from a different perspective and a different angle? And so she says, I'm going to give you an assignment. You're not going to like it. And she always prefaced it with, Anne, you're not going to like it. Because I have never liked one weenie frickin' thing they have ever, ever told me to do in Alan on because they tell you stupid crap. They just do. I don't know if it's just because it's easy stuff to say, but that's the way that I look at it. You know, because, because when I have huge problems and I bring them to my sponsor in my meeting, this is, this is the guidance I get. Let go and let God. Easy does it. 
one day at a time. You know, and I'm like, gee whiz, why didn't I think of that? I mean, it's so stupid. Did you not hear my problem? Really? And I'm supposed to let go and let God? Let go and let God what? There should be part two to that one, I think. You know, it's... But in reality, what I have found out, my experience is that and how I am affected by the family disease of alcoholism, it doesn't matter what my problem is. How I'm affected by the family disease of alcoholism makes me just magnify it so big because it's not what's going on right now. It's if that happens and then what if this happens and then what if that happens and the next thing you know, I mean, I have made this little weenie thing so massive, you know, that it seems insurmountable. There is no answer for it. And that's how, again, the, the uh, alcoholism manifests itself through the family disease through me. You know, and what happens is, is when I bring you my problem, and then you say, Larsine, what's really happening right now at this moment? You know, then the answer is, this is what's going on. You know, and it becomes manageable again. The family disease of alcoholism doesn't want you to think that there's any answer. It is so big, there is nothing that's going to fix this. When in reality, if I look at what's really going on right now, it is. It, it, it is doable. And you know how it's doable? One day at a time. Let go and let God. Easy does it. That is truly the answers to it. You know, and that's why I love about Al-Anon and what I've always loved about Al-Anon. It's just about the truth. And the family disease of alcoholism is about the lie. They're drinking at you. They're trying to hurt you. You know, and all I know how to do when someone's trying to hurt me, I've been well trained. You hurt them back. That's what you do. That's what you do, and that's how I, so anyway, she gives me this assignment, and she tells me, I want you to go home, and I want you to think about a good thing your father has done for me, done for you, and my initial reaction is, there's no such thing. How am I supposed to think about a good thing my dad has done for me, when my very first remembrance on the face of this planet is fear at my father's hands, and I'm supposed to think of something good he did for me? Really? Are you kidding me? But again, one thing I believe is God's grace for me when I first came into Al-Anon that I will eternally be grateful for, as I heard at one of those first meetings, is that you have to be willing. You have to be willing to do something different, because if you're not willing to do something different, how can you possibly expect anything to change? And so for whatever reason I heard that, and it was a believable statement to me. It made sense to me, and I've always had this much willingness, not much more. But again, this program is so powerful, I only think you need this much willingness. That's how powerful it is. But you do need some, so I've always been willing. And I don't know how long it took me, a week or two weeks, and I remember that my dad taught me how to drive. You know, and if you're going to live in Southern California and marry an alcoholic of your own and track that sucker down, it's a skill you just got to have, okay? <laughs> because unlike you and AA, we in Al-Anon like to be licensed, okay? We just like it, okay? Just. There's a, there's a comfort there, you know, and uh, so, uh, and he taught me how to drive, and I did not think my sponsor would be happy with that answer. I didn't, I really didn't think she, but it was honestly, it's the only thing I could come up with. And I sincerely hope that if you're an Alan on you are sponsored, it's just, I can't say enough about sponsorship. To me, it's like having your own personal rooting section. They want you to do well. They just do for no, and why? What is their vested interest in it, you know? Because again, we talk about this, this is a spiritual life. I, it's the only place I know of when other people are doing well, you might as well be doing as well as they are. The joy that comes from that is just indescribable. Again, it has to be spiritual because I can't explain it in any other way. And so I went to Jeannie and I said, I thought up a good thing my dad had done. You know, and, and, and Jeannie, my first sponsor, oh, she, she had a really thick Dutch accent. You could hardly understand a bloody word she said unless she was your sponsor, and then it was pretty clear. But, uh, but she was a clapper, which irritated the crap out of me, you know, because every time I did something good, she would go, you know, which I thought was very, very condescending. And, uh, and uh, so I went to her, you know, I thought of a good thing my dad had done. And, uh, and so I told her, and now I think, oh, she's not going to like this answer. Oh, my God, did she not? She loved that answer. You'd think I'd come up with the cure for cancer. Because it was my rookie year in Al-Anon, and I didn't know when your sponsor gave you an assignment that there would be part two, which is way harder than part one, let me tell you. And now part two was every time I thought about something, you know, a beating I took at my dad's hands, you know, and I'd much rather take a beating than the verbal thing because my dad was just, I mean, he's a master sergeant. He just had a way about him, and um, I'd much rather take that than take the, the, the verbal. But, but any time I thought about those things, the times he made me feel bad about myself, about being a girl because he had issues with having girls and all this other crap, he just says, whenever you think, when any of that comes, she goes, I just want you to replace it with this positive thought that your dad taught you how to drive. And... Um, 
She said, you know what, your father died with all of his children hating him, being grateful that he was dead, happy about it, no less. You have children? Is that what you want to have happen to you? Do you think that that's what your father wanted to have happen to him? Or can you accept the fact that he was a sick alcoholic and he paid the ultimate price? Not only did he die, he died with his family hating him, being grateful that he was dead. Do you need to punish anybody more than that? And I had to think about it. You know, and I don't mean to say I grew up with this hellacious dad who beat us and made us feel bad about us, ourselves and who we were, and all the crap that went along with all of that stuff, and that my sponsor gave me this little weeny assignment, and I did it, and now it's rainbows and butterflies out my butt all the time. You know, that is not what happens in Al-Anon at all. You know, what my sponsor gave me that day, which I think is one of the most precious gifts that we get in Al-Anon, is she gave me the gift of forgiveness. And now in our literature, it says, forgiveness is no favor. We do it for nobody but ourselves. Because see, I always thought if I forgave my dad, I was letting him off the hook, and I wasn't going to let him off the hook, because it was wrong. And al has never tried to teach me that that was right or anything. It's, n it's not what it's about at all. It's about the disease of alcoholism and how I'm affected by it and how my father was affected by it. You know, and I always thought that if I let him off the hook, I was letting him get away with it. When in reality, what I've learned in forgiveness is what forgiveness does is it gives me the opportunity to have the shot at a good life. And if you want me to, you want me to tell you what Alan does for me every day, it gives me the, sh the opportunity to have the shot at a good life. But I'm the one that's got to take the shot. I am the one. That's all that it does. It affords me this opportunity by working these steps to the best of my ability to have the shot at a good life. And when I was able to give, forgive my dad and understand that he was a sick alcoholic, and that was the very best that he could do. Who am I to question the very best that anybody can do? That's just the best that they can do. I can't ask any more of that. And he died ultimately with his children hating him, being grateful he was dead. I don't need to punish anybody more than that. Uh, when my dad ended up you know, dying, he was, uh, my dad was a Korean War veteran, a World War II veteran. He was a very good soldier. He was a lifer in the Army. He saved people's lives in, during the war. He's a Purple Heart recipient. He was a good soldier, there's no question about that. You know, and they ended up bringing me, you know, my mom had divorced him and I was in charge of everything, you know, so they brought me his ashes and the flag and all this stuff and I happened to be home alone that day and they dropped all that stuff off. And I took my dad's ashes downstairs and put them in our laundry room behind our garage there and I took them down the garage and I put them in the laundry room and I put them behind the washing machine and I said, you sit here and you think about what you did. And, uh, <laughs> My dad sat there for a bloody long time, let me tell you, okay? A long, long time, you know? Every time I go down the laundry, hey, Sarge, guess who's in charge now, Sarge, you know? You know, and girls rule, okay? <laughs> you know, and every so often I pick up that box and shake the shit out of it. There, how does that feel, you know? Because it's a process and it was all sponsor approved, okay? I just want you to know. We all got to do what we got to do. But anyway, uh, when, when I was a teenager, my dad got out of the Army. We moved to Southern California. Up and at this point, I was born in Europe. We always lived on, you know, in military bases, Eastern Seymour. We moved to California in the 60s. No rules and regulations there at all. You know, we're, us girls are getting old enough to date. Very, very hard to date in my house because uh, my dad has a lot of rules and regulations about dating. We have to bring these little weenie boys home to meet my dad. My, I said my dad's over six foot tall. He's got one dark, dark eyebrow. He can raise like six inches over this side of his forehead. He looks like the devil himself standing there. And, and he's an ex-master sergeant. There's not really even such a thing as an ex-master sergeant. That just always stays with you. And So we'd bring these little weenie boys home and my dad would give them the master sergeant drill. Where are you going? When are you going to be back and then he would tell them what part of their anatomy he was going to remove if we weren't returned in the virginal condition of which we left the house in the first place so really hard to get a second date in my house almost ever never ever happened and uh, you know I had one guy I didn't even make I didn't get out the door with him you know he was just gone you know and um, you know but the fact that my dad always had a handgun or a hand grenade in his hand never helped matters any. And, um, but again I never thought anything about that because my dad was always, he always had a gun or a hand grenade. He was always going to blow up the neighbors or the Helm Bakery guy or, you know, again, he's drunk every day. He's pissed off at somebody every single solitary day. And I share this with you because, see, this is how I get affected by the disease of alcoholism. I liken growing up with the disease of alcoholism is like having a bowl of crap in front of you. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that'll eat a bowl of crap in one sitting. But I'm here to tell you, growing up in an alcoholic home, 
that you'll choke down a teaspoon of that every single solitary day if that's what you have to do just to make it be quiet, just to have some kind of peace. Again, hoping tomorrow will be different. You know, that's just, that's just, it, because the behavior is so crazy. It says in our Al-Anon literature, you know, how we become nervous and irritable without knowing it. You know, and it's when every good sense tells us that there's something wrong with the alcoholics drinking and thinking, we still hide how we feel and what we know. And we know it's crazy, but we're living in the middle of it, so I have to rationalize and justify and make it be okay. That's what I have to do. And so anyway, uh, when I was 17, I met my husband. I should have known there was something wrong with him because my dad liked him right away, okay? And that, like, it never, ever happened before. And, um, you know, and I remember, and, and, but, and Butch and I, you know, the, we were fixed up. It was a blind date, you know, and, uh, uh, and we went on this bowling date. And after we went bowling, um, Butch stopped at a liquor store, and he'd asked me what I would like to drink. Well, you know, Butch is a few years older than me, and uh, he'd been married once before, back living with his mom and dad, had a kid. Should have been clue number two to me that there was something wrong, but that went right over my head. Um, he wasn't wearing underwear either, which I think is always a big clue that you're going out with an alcoholic. I think it should be in the al literature, but just my opinion. And, um, uh, but anyway, um, he stops at a liquor store, and I'm 17, and he asks me what I would like to drink. Well, there are laws in the state of California about the drinking age, and I proceed to tell him the laws of the state of California, and that I am an underage minor, buddy. And I know he, hear, he heard that day what he still hears today when he doesn't want to hear what I'm saying, and he heard blah, 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 blah. You know, and he went in and got a gallon of Red Mountain wine, if nothing else, to impress me with his wine knowledge, because I don't know nothing about wine. And uh, we went back to his house, we played this game. It's called Pass Out. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it or not <laughs> first date and uh, but it was a game with rules I read the rules I'm big on that stuff and uh, and so I play this game and and and, it, and I don't drink because it's against the law to drink you know I have learned really early on boy do what the Sarge tells you to do you will follow orders do not rock the boat you know and I am a rule person I it's just, it's been ingrained in me. And so I don't drink because it's against the law for me to drink. But now I'm going to play a game called Pass Out. You know, and I have another rule is I have to win every game I play. So, uh, because, and again, that's army training. We do not surrender. That's a bad word in my house. You know, you will win. If you have to cheat, it doesn't matter. This is war. It's always full out war. If you're playing the game, you will be victorious. And, uh, you know, and I got stories that my dad, oh, never mind, I'm not even going to go into all that. But he used to give me a baseball bat when I was playing with older kids so I could be the crap out of them if they didn't let me win and uh, so other people wouldn't let me play with their kids but again that's another deal and um, but um, but I have to win so I drank a, maybe a half a glass of this god-awful wine and I won that was that what that was all about and guess who drank the rest of the wine and uh, and and I'm gonna tell you what I still remember about that day God I had so much fun he's a fun guy just fun, 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 fun. Made me feel good. Just, I just had the best time of my life. And, uh, and believe you me, you know, um, you know, I'm 17 years old. Boy, I got a lot of rules and regulations about what's going to happen in my life. The house I'm growing up in, you can cut the hate between my mom and dad with a knife. And my life is going to be so different. Boy, I got a card about what my life is going to be like. And I'm going to marry a guy, and he's going to love me. And he's going to want to have nothing but all girl children. We're going to have like eight, nine girls. And, uh, and he's not going to drink, because I know my dad's a drunk. I know that that's, that's the problem that's going on. And now I go out with Butch, you know, and, uh, and we go on the state. And he's so much fun. But boy, number one on my list, no drinking. And he's drunk. I mean, I, you know. And this is where I will stand toe to toe and rationalize with any alcoholic because I will justify and rationalize behavior as much as any alcoholic because I want what I want like I want it. And I want to go out with this guy again, but he's drinking number one on the list. And again, this is where I just think crap up. And growing up in an alcoholic home, I think it's very, very common. You know, you learn you can't ask questions. You learn really early on not to do that. So we just think up answers. I mean, it's just I watch what's going on. I make my best guess. You know, and then I make a decision based on that. I call it information from nowhere, you know, because I'm not really finding nothing out. I'm just guessing what's going on. And the answers are floating up in the universe land here, become fact for me, and I act upon it. Now, I want to go out with Butch again, but he's drinking, number one on my list, no drinking again. So, you know, information from nowhere lands here, becomes fact for me, because I instantly decide. See, when my dad's drinking, when my dad's drinking, he wants to hit you and yell at you and make you feel bad about who you are. When my husband's drinking, he just wants to hug you and kiss you and tell you how pretty you are. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can work with that, okay? 
That has the potential that only we can see in the alcoholic with our little magic mirror, you know. No one else can see that. If you would just do what we told you to do, then everything would be great. But no, we're not going to do that. So anyway, Butch and I, you know, ended up, you know, dating exclusively. It was uh, very, very difficult for me to... Um, date Butch, uh, basically because he couldn't remember my name, but you can't let a little thing like that stop you from going out with an alcoholic, now can you, right? That should be the worst thing that ever happens, you know, and he'd call me up Lorraine, Lucerne, whatever, you know, and uh, he knows my name now pretty good, it took a while, but he's got it down now, but, but I have to share the story with my dad because it really is a healing story with my dad. My dad named me Larsine. And he named me Larsine because he said it was the name of a town in Scotland, and my dad was very, very proud of his Scottish heritage. You have to know how disappointed my dad was that I was first born and I was not a boy. And he got girls after that, and he got worse and worse, but he was very, very, very hurt that I was not a boy. But because I was first born, you know, he couldn't name me after him. It was the worst day of his life. I mean, this is just the story he's always told me. But I'm going to name you after this town in Scotland because that's the, that's the best I can give you since you disappointed me so much. Oh, you know, I, and it's all, it's all good and dandy, right? But I've always been proud of it because he's always told me that. And so I've always been proud. Larsing, the name of a town in Scotland. Fast forward, I've done the big, my dad's dead. I've done the big forgiveness exercise. I get curious about Larsing, Scotland. And this is before Google and computers. You wanted information. You went to buildings called libraries, OK? And I go to the library to look up Larsing, Scotland, and nothing. You know, I can find nothing on this. So I go to the reference librarian because it's just a little neighborhood library and I tell her what I know you know can you look this up for me it's the name of a town in Scotland it's really all the information I have come back in a couple weeks we'll send it to the downtown library we'll see what we can find out for you I come back in two weeks no such place as Larsing Scotland and now I am pissed you know, I'm an al -Anon, but it's just like, you know, I did this big forgiveness exercise with my dad, and here he is stabbing me from the grave, you know? Because again, you know, how is my head so different? You know, it's still about me. It's still about how it affects me. It's just like, one more time, you're hurting me, you're hurting me, because that's, I'm so hardwired for all of that garbage. And, um, and then we have a friend, you know, who's in AA, and he goes, you know, and he goes to Scotland every year to go golf, and he goes, Larsine, before you go whack-a-doodle, let me go to Scotland and ask my friends in Scotland. You know, Scotland's a really old country. Maybe there was Larsine, Scotland, like hundreds, thousands of years ago. Let me ask these people before you go whack-a-doodle. So he goes to Scotland. He comes back two weeks later. No one in Scotland has ever heard of frickin' Larsine, Scotland. <laughs> You know, so now I'm going to change my name, bite me, dad, okay? I am on this horse, and, uh, you know, no matter what my sponsor says to me, I don't care. <laughs> and uh, so I'm with my husband at his big AA Saturday night meeting, and this friend walks up to me in AA, and he goes, Larsine, you're not going to believe this. I found out that Larsine is a Scottish word. I'm like, you're kidding me. He goes, it is Scottish, for father was drunk when daughter was born, so daughter got a weird name. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Now, I know it's not true. I knew right at the moment it wasn't true. But what he went on to say to me is, you know, Larsine, I'm alcoholic like your dad is alcoholic. You know, and he goes, and I don't know if he was drunk that day. I don't know if he wrote it down wrong. I don't know what happened. He goes, but I'm here to tell you that I really believe that your dad believed when he named you Larsine that it was the name of the town in Scotland. And just because it's not wrapped the way that you think that it needs to be wrapped, does it make it any less of a gift? And seeing left to my own devices, I'll hate my dad, I'll change my name, even work in a program in Helena not because I am hardwired for all that self-centeredness. Not so much different from the alcoholic at all. But I take it to you, you show me a different way to look at it, and I get the shot at a good life if I so choose to take it. You know, and that's what happens here over and over and over and over again. And I need to be reminded about that all the time. You know, now it's like, you know, I'm really proud of it. I know it's, you know, and in reality what I've learned is my name means nothing, but I take it to you and you show me a different way to look at it, and now it means everything to me. I have Larsine on my license plate, seven letters. It fits perfect. You know, a couple years ago my husband got me license plate holders that say, it's the name of a town in Scotland. And, um, <laughs> And I swear to God, I have two, I've had two total strangers come up to me and tell me they have been there. <laughs> you can't make it up, okay? You just can't, okay? It's, it's, it's just what goes on. But anyway, uh, you know, so anyway, you know, so Butch and I started dating, and like I say, you know, and, and I mean, he never hid from me his drug use, his alcohol, none of that stuff. He was always in my face. This is what I do. 
He never pretended he didn't. I'll tell you, when I walked into Al-Anon, if you would have said, Larsine, did you have any idea your husband was drinking like he was or doing drugs? I would have absolutely said I had no idea. Because again, it's the lie of the family disease of alcoholism. I'll tell you, I'm the most responsible person on the face of the planet, but I don't want to take responsibility for the choices that I make. Because I have learned, I've grown up, and it's somebody else's fault. Somebody has to be at fault. I am hardwired for that. It's a terrible thing to be hardwired with. You know, what I've learned in, you know, in working through the book and working through the steps and whatever it's just everybody you're just looking at oh, everybody just looks at it you guys are looking from alcoholism as people who are afflicted with the disease of alcoholism you're just on one side of the glass I'm on the other to you it looks like it's on the right to me it looks like it's on the left neither one of us is wrong it's just the way that we're looking at it from it's just the way that we're looking at it from. And, you know, and that's the lesson that I constantly have to keep redoing and redoing and redoing. It's not, it's not about whose fault it is. It's about what's the problem now, what's the solution? Where are we going to go from here? And um, so anyway, you know, so Butch and I started dating. And, um, and uh, what ended up happening is after we dated for a couple of years, I got pregnant. I don't care if it's a big deal for you, huge deal for me, you know, because now I'd broken the big rule and the big regulation. And when our life got really, really bad behind my husband's drinking and using, I was sure it was because God was punishing me. I didn't believe in God, never went to church, never been baptized. None of that stuff was a deal for me, you know. But again, one more time, I got to blame someone, you know, so I'm just blaming this God, you know. And it's been my experience since I've been in Al-Anon that I don't, I don't think God gives a crap about what you did or where you've been or how you did it. He only cares about what you're doing right here, right now. That's all that matters, you know. What's God's will for us? I mean, you know, again, I think it's pretty much defined in, actually, in the chapter of the family afterwards, you know. We are sure that God wants us to be happy, joyous, and free. And then the question is, what do I do to honor that? You know, when you know what God wants for you, what do you do to honor that? It's not to get struck with the happy, joyous, and wan, you know, fairy dust. You know, it's what are you doing? And I do have choices. The family disease of alcoholism wants me to think that I don't that I'm just stuck in this and it's always going to be this way and I'm always going to be miserable. No, I have choices. Choice, they're not always feel good choices, but I have choices every single solitary day. You know, so we ended up getting married a month or a couple of months after our son was born. If you ask me when I was pregnant when I got married, no, I wasn't, but that's your problem to figure out. You know, there was a baby there, but none of your business. And, uh, and up until that point, I'd never talked to Butch about his drinking or his drug use, but that night, you know, the day after we got married, I sat him in the kitchen chair and I told him the rules and regulations and how it's going to go down, you know, you're going to get, you know, once a month you can go out and party. Other than that, you're working, you're bringing home a paycheck, you're giving me the money, you understand the plan, he did this, which I took as affirmative. What I know today, he's so drunk and loaded, he said he was just doing this thing. And, uh, you know, and I know this because day three of our marriage, he does not come home all night long. You know, and this is a huge violation of the rules and regulations that I have sat down. And I am proud to stand before you and tell you my husband begged for the silent treatment. He begged for it. He never got it one time, boy. Because I was like just, I was like a little dog, you know, just as soon as he'd come in, just, nya, 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 and, and language, I don't even know where I learned this language from. Again, information from nowhere lands here becomes fact for me, because I'm sure if I say the right mothers and effers in the right order, he'll have some spiritual awakening, you know, or whatever the deal is. <laughs> Just the insanity and the craziness is it's in, absolutely insane. And uh, I'm just going to tell you one drunk story. And uh, I got a call one day from his friends uh, that I affectionately refer to as the scum of the earth people. And um, <laughs> these are the drug dealers. And my husband is so drunk and so loaded at their house that if I do not come and get him, they, the drug dealers, are going to call the police. OK, that's the condition, you know. So I put on my cape, and off I go to rescue him like I always do. And uh, and, I, and our son was just a baby at the time, and uh, he's laying in the drug dealer's bushes. They kicked him out of the house, you know, and I'll never forget the drug dealers looking between the Venetian blinds to see if I've come to get him. And I get him in the car, drive home. I take our infant son upstairs, put him in his crib. I come down to get Butch. He's gotten out of the car, fallen in the street, cracked his head on the curb. I'm bleeding. I'd like to tell you I am concerned about him. I am not, you know. Um, <laughs> I am not, you know, it was always my plan that he should die. You know, someone said, why didn't you just divorce him and let him win? I don't think so. That's not going to happen. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You know, so, but I don't want anybody to see him in this condition, you know, so, and I can't lift him up because he's 180 pounds of wet washcloth. I mean, you know, forget it. So I grab him by the ankles. I heave him up over the curb. I'm dragging him down the sidewalk, little trickle of blood following, you know. It's like a little snail trail-like thing. And, uh, 
And why we call these people normies, I have not a clue. But I'm dragging a guy bleeding by the head down the sidewalk, and this guy's driving down the street, and he stops his car and says, are you having a problem? <laughs> I go, yes, my husband's fallen, and he can't get up. And uh, it was the truth. So anyway, we get him up, and, and so he's, you know, the guy's got him you know, across his shoulder, and I'm on the other side. And, and for whatever reason, again, I'm a very organized. You know, when emergencies happen, I just make a list in my head. One, two, three. I'm trained that way. That's what I do. And so and once it goes on the list, it's got to get checked off. It's going down in that order. So not only does he have a head injury, I have to get him in the house. I have to get him upstairs because he has to be in bed because that's on the list. So, and now we're going up the stairs, and Mr., you know, and Butch and I are just cursing and yelling and screaming at each other, and Mr. Good Samaritan no longer wishes to participate, okay? <laughs> Not everybody likes the crazy, okay? They don't. And so that guy was out the door, and now Butch is on the bedspread, big puddle of blood. I'd like to tell you, oh my God, you know, and stuff, but I am, you know, I want him to die, but I don't want my fingerprints anywhere, you know, and, um, <laughs> And I'm the only one in the house. Okay, what am I going to do here? So I call 911. I'm hysterical. They said a hook and ladder truck, paramedics, you know, the police, everybody's there. I'm in the bedroom with the baby crying. You know, the paramedics clean them all up. He's got a little freaking weenie cut, you know. But, but, the, but the police come in and they go, Mrs. Gantner, your husband says he injured himself because you pushed him down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and of course, I had not done that. But this is serious stuff going on here. I have a small child with me right here. My husband has accused me of doing this you know, hellacious thing. They could take my child away from me. They could arrest me and take me to jail. Do I, and, and I am the sober person in this whole scenario. You know, and do I have any? No, I tell you what I do. I go red hot. I just go so freaking raging angry how I am affected by the disease of alcoholism because I don't even care. So I tell the Redondo Beach police I didn't do that, but if you'll prop him up, I'll be happy to push him down in front of the Redondo Beach police. <laughs> because that's the insanity of my disease. Because I want someone to say, you are so right, Larsine. You are the good guy. What's going on in your house is crazy. Because alcoholism doesn't want you to think that. You know, I mean, I'm, my husband all the time, he's like, you know, um, he loses vehicles which still baffles me to this day. Okay, I'm sorry. You guys are like, how do you lose things that weigh thousands of pounds? I, I just don't even know how you do that. But he, he lo he's, he's a truck loser from way back. And, uh, and so he's home and there's no truck. And I'll say to him, Butch, where's your truck? And you know what you say back? What truck? Like there isn't a truck to be had, you know? And then when it's not there, you go, well, what happened to my truck? Like I know what happened to your truck. That's the insanity of the thing. One time he told me, we're having a big fight. I'm leaving you. I'm done. No, Larsine, don't. We'll get a babysitter. We'll go out to dinner. I'm not going to drink anymore. We go out to dinner. We're going to talk about it. We go to this Italian restaurant. First thing he does is order a carafe of wine. I thought you said you're not going to drink anymore. You know what he says to me? This is wine. <laughs> I, you know, and then I start thinking, is wine alcohol? That's how convincing you are, OK? And what I know from reading this book is you're so convincing because you believe it. And that's the insanity. And I don't understand. And that's the craziness. So anyway, you know, Bush gets all cleaned up. He's got a little weenie cut. The paramedics got to take him, you know, because he's too drunk to walk. You know, so I don't know your neighborhood, but all my neighbors are out front, you know, and stuff. And Butch is always, he's still, to this day, I mean, all the neighbors know him. You know, they don't know me because I'm huge on anonymity. I speak to no one. And, uh, but Butch goes out on the gurney, and they're all out front, and he's on the gurney, hey, Frank, hey, Joe, you know, and stuff like that. And they're, Butch, what happened? Larsine pushed me down the floor. So. <laughs> and everybody believes him. Why? Because all they ever see is easygoing drunk Butch and screaming banshee Larsine. That's the insanity. That's the insanity. You know, and then we had this incident, Butch is one of nine kids. We were going to have a family reunion, his family reunion. It's a big deal. And, um, and I make him raise his right hand and promise me he'll be sober that day so we can go. And the day comes, and guess who's so drunk and so loaded he can't even stand up? And I am so angry, just so, so angry. And I'm here to tell you, no matter how blacked out or drunk my husband's been, he's never raised a hand to hit me, because that's not who he is, and it's not what he does. He's not a verbally abusive guy, none of that. You know, but, all, you know, but what I started doing is I started poking him in the chest. Let's, why don't you just hit me? Let's just take it to the next level. Because all I know is I, all I know how to do is push back and push back as hard as I, as hard as I can. You're hurting me, so I'm going to hurt you back. 
And I remember all of a sudden, you know, um, our two, at this point we have two little boys and they're like five and three years old and they're standing on either side of me yanking at my pant leg. Mommy, mommy, please stop yelling at daddy. And I would like to tell you that I had a moment of clarity then, but I did not. What I started doing was I started screaming at those little boys. How dare they tell me to stop yelling at their dad when he's the reason our life is the piece of crap that it is. And by the time I get done screaming at these little boys, I watch my drunken husband walk out the front door and I, the sober mom, say to the drunken dad, where do you think you're going? And the drunken father turns to the sober mom and says, I'm leaving because we're upsetting the kids. And I don't tell you this story because I'm proud of it. I tell you this story because this is how I'm affected by the disease of alcoholism and I don't even know it. Because I hide under the illusion that I'm the good guy. I'm the one with the job. I'm the one keeping a roof over our head. You know, in the beginning, you know, the alcoholics things always just seem so big, but they do. Spend entire paychecks in one night. How can you do that when I need diapers and formula? How can you spend all our money? You know, it's just, you know, it, and then what ends up happening is, you know, my things just seem like they're so small until my things are just twice as big as what the alcoholic is. But I don't see it because I have justifiable anger. Boy, I hang on to that. I'm right, you're wrong. That's the hill I die on over and over and over again because I can't see my husband for the sick person that he is. Because I know with every fiber of my being, every time he told me, Larsine, I'm sorry. I love you and I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt our children. I know he meant it when he said it to me. I know he did because I know when he's lying. And I know when he was really sincere. You know, but I still couldn't, I couldn't stop it though. I would hear the voice in my head, Larsine, leave it be. Don't fight. Don't get into it. But then that ego, that huge ego that's in there, don't take no crap. Your mother took crap. You don't need to take that crap. Because again, I live under the illusion that I can yell and scream you into some kind of submission. Because that's how I was raised, the person that yells the loudest wins. You know, oh good. And what I had to learn in Al-Anon is I got a lot of misinformation from a person who had a lot of misinformation. That's all that is, and it wasn't about trying to teach me wrong or anything. He passed on what he had to pass on, it was the best that he had. And um, so anyway, um, you know, what ended up happening is, you know, somewhere in there I went to my very first Al-Anon meeting. I sat in that front row, they have the great literature on the table, and, uh, you know, and they were telling me, you know, how, you know, what I could do for myself, you know, and, and my children. You know, but, but, you know, I didn't want to hear that. I only want the piece of literature that's how to get them sober and do what you want them to do, because that's all I am interested in. Yet when I'm sitting in that front row, Larsine, do you want your life to be different? Oh, my God, do I want my life to be different? Larsine, what are you willing to do about it? Nothing, because it's not my fault. You know, again, that justifiable anger. I say justifiable anger is just as deadly to the Al-Anon as the first drink is to the alcoholic. You know, we go back into the insanity and back in the craziness and my husband's last nine months of drinking are just pretty much a total blackout for him, you know, and, um, uh, you know, and then in the last nine months of his drinking, he ended up getting arrested for drunk driving, which is no big deal. He got arrested lots of times, but this was in the 70s. He always got let go on recognizance. You always hire a lawyer for $1,000, reduced to reckless driving, blah, blah, blah. We've done it so many times. Why this was different, it just was. But, uh, you know, so anyway, he's in jail, and then, you know, I pick him up the next day, and, and I knew something was going on because I didn't say anything. And believe you me, I know that God was working in Butch's life because it takes a power greater than anything on the face of this planet to keep my mouth shut. I, I can't, to this day, I can't explain it. I cannot explain it. And, uh, you know, and I just found out about this hospital program that they had just started, and, uh, so anyway, after a couple of days, you know, he comes down and makes that understatement of the century. I think I have a problem because you guys are so quick on picking up on that. And, um, <laughs> and so I gave him the number of the hospital. And again, God working in his life because I'm, I'm the organizer. I'm the one that does the stuff. But I didn't. I just gave him the number. Here, you call these people and see if they can help you. And he arranged to go into the hospital, and I remember him going into the mental. They had to put him in the metal part of the, you know, the lockup ward first because he had to go, he had to detox. He's been through DTs before when he tried to quit, so they had to detox him from all the drugs and all the alcohol, so he's in the metal part, the metal institutional part of it, you know, and stuff. And so I'm leaving, and the guards are there, and they're letting me out the locked doors and stuff. And I hear Butch Larsing, come back, come back, you know, and I walk back because I'm sure it's because he's changed his mind. But instead, he reached into his pocket and he handed me the Valium that he brought in case of emergency. And he never parted with the Valium in his life, let me tell you. He never parted with anything in his life. And, uh, and, I, you know, and, and I knew something was different, you know. And I went home and I took that Valium because I was a freaking bastard. <laughs> 
I think I slept for like 26 hours on one 10 milligram Valium. But in my own defense, I was really, really tired. And, uh, you know, so I'd go to the mental institution to go visit dad, you know, and to cheer him up, the kids were little. I'd bring him, you know, the paintings they did in kindergarten and preschool. But no, he wanted to show me what he made in occupational therapy. <laughs> We'd go home and hang his projects on the refrigerator. <laughs> Look, Daddy's sober. He's painting pictures. Woohoo! You know, it's crazy. You know, and then they ended up. You know, after he was there for a couple of weeks, they introduced him to the alcoholism treatment side of that program, which included the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and I'm very, very grateful to tell you. You know, my husband has been sober. Uh, July the 21st, 1979. He's got 39 years, well into his 40th. <laughs> And I'm so grateful to AA because you really saved the life of a good man. And I can't thank you enough for that. I always get weepy about this part, and I hate it because I'm not a crier. You don't cry in the army. It's not allowed. But, um, and Alan Otto whoosh your ass out, too, just giving you a warning. But, um, but I always get weepy about this part, not because my husband lived, because AA ruined my plans. You know, you saved him. <laughs> thank you very much. And, um, but I want you to think about if my husband had died and my wish had come true. And I want you to think about that really angry woman raising those two kids. And I want you to think about what kind of life you think we would have today. You know, it's easy to blame the alcoholic. You know, if you want to just put all that on them. But when, when they're gone, you know, what kind of a person do you think I would have been today raising those two little boys? That's how, you, that's how the family is affected by the disease of alcoholism. So anyway, then he gets sober. And I'm sorry, you guys, you know how you are when you first get sober. It's like... I'm sober, give me the checkbook, you know. <laughs> you know, 30 days and it's like, you know, kiss my sober butt, it's wonderful, you know. It's all of it, it's just like, and again, my interpretation of it, it's weird. You know, because all of a sudden he's all oh, happy and lovey and I go with them to AA meetings, AA women come up to me, are you Butch's wife? Yes, I am. We just love him. <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, chapter five, how it works. I get him sober and you steal him away from me. That's, you know, again, all the sick crap. And, being, and, I, and I'm sharing this with you because it's so important to know. It's not always easy being a family member and all this stuff is going on. I've been dealing with my husband for years, trying to help him every way I knew how to help him. You know, and, and it, obviously not the best or whatever, but doing the very best that I could. And then, boy, he's an AA, and boy, he just loves you guys up the freaking gazoo. You know how wonderful you are, and this is, and that is. I go with him to meetings, because I need to make sure he hears what he's supposed to hear, because he's not real quick. And there's only 12 steps. How stupid are you people? How long does this take? I mean, good God. And, um, but you know, as a new, when you're at a meeting, I mean, I, I, was at, I was at one of those very first meetings, and some guy got up to the freaking podium, and he got his driver's license, and the whole room came unglued. <laughs> I've had a driver's license since I was 16. It's not a big deal. And, uh, but I don't know what's a big deal in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I come to find out that if you have a driver's license and a good registration and insurance, that is the trifecta of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> But my interpretation is, you guys set the bar really low, okay? No wonder you're all so happy. You don't have to do much here, you know? Just, okay. And it's because I come in expecting so much. You know, I just, I just want to have peace and quiet. I just want my husband to be well. I just want to have a family like I've always thought a family is supposed to be. And I've learned now on you can't make that happen. You can't force that. You know what, people ask me all the time, you know what Al-Anon is about? If I have to say what Al-Anon is about in one word, it's about love. And it's just, and that is, there's no more to it than that. You know, when Bill talks about, you know, the Al-Anon and his mom being focused and all that other time, believe you me, I know we joke about it and all that, but it's all coming from love. Because I, I know his mom, I went to meetings with her mom, and I know how much his mom loved him and wanted him to be as well. It's what every parent wants for every kid. You know, we, we had a deal with our son. You know, when, when I first find out Butch was alcoholic and, and somebody said to me, you know, it's hereditary and it's in your genes and stuff. My boys were little. I went home. I made them both raise their right hand and promised me they would not be alcoholic. 
Okay, we did pinky squares the whole freaking nine yards. Fast forward, you know, I'm in Al-Anon a while now, and Butch is sober a while. We're both really active. I come home from a meeting. My son, my youngest son is 12 years old. He has um, uh, done, uh, dropped LSD. And Butch comes up and goes, Earl just dropped LSD. Oh my God, you know, and Butch is like, calm down, calm down. Uh, you know, I, I've got him listening to Mozart and drinking milk. Because <laughs> isn't it nice and handy that Butch knows what to do when you drop LSD? Oh, thank you. I'm glad that came in handy there. Who knew we needed that for parental training? And uh, I've been in Allen on a while. I don't give a crap. He is not going to listen to Mo Mozart and drink milk. I'm going in. And, uh, and I'm in the bedroom with him all night long. And, uh, and he still tells the story because apparently having your mother in your face all night long when you're on LSD going, is this what you wanted to have happen to you? It's not fun. It's not fun. And I have never made amends to that kid for it, and I'm never going to. Okay? I'm just telling you. But that kid was, was a roller coaster ride for us. I mean, just absolute insanity. And, uh, and then I'm, we're at our South Bay Roundup, and we have a great roundup just like you guys do, all of our friends. And, uh, and, and, you know, and my son is 19 at this point. I'm 15 years in Al-Anon. It's been a roller coaster ride. And, and I come home, and I'm very disciplined about my exercise deal. And I've been gone for three days, so now I've got to do three days of exercise, you know, in one hour. And, and so, because uh, it's just how it is for me. And I have a treadmill in the garage, and I go out to my treadmill. And, you know, and, and I've just come home from the roundup. I mean, I am full of love and serenity and peace and just, just the stuff that happens in these rooms. And, but I go out to my treadmill, and next to my treadmill is my son's weight bench. And on there is a driver's license. It's a woman's driver's license. It has information. I love information. This woman lives in Glendora, California. Her birth date's on there. She's 32 years old. I instantly decide in 10 seconds or less, information lands here, that she has been in my house. She has had sex with my 19-year-old son. She has two kids, wants to marry him and call me mom. I am all over this story, okay? <laughs> you know, and I run in the house and I show Butch the driver's license and nothing, because the man has no imagination whatsoever. <laughs> driver's license. No, it's not a driver's license. This is what happened. You know, and his eyes roll back in his head when I'm crazy like that, like they always do. We call Carol. Carol's my sponsor now, you know. You're nuts. So I call Carol. I tell her what I think happened, you know, and Carol rarely gives me direction, but that day she told me to shut up. She goes, she goes, I know you are scared for this kid. And what's the worst thing that can happen? They can die, and it happens. I can't tell you how many funerals I've been to for people who have lost their children because of this disease. And I'm here to tell you, there's nobody that feels like a black belt Al-Anon ever when that is going on. It's not what Al-Anon is about. It's not about not caring. It's not about turning. It's about unconditional love. That's what Al-Anon is about. And, um, and so I was, you know, and again, my fear, my fear drives me as, as much as it drives an alcoholic, absolutely positively. She says, Larsina takes just as much efforts to think good thoughts for this kid as it does bad ones. So instead of thinking up crap in that head to add to a plate that's already got enough crap on it, why don't you just pray for him instead? And I end my conversations as I often do with my sponsor, never mind, you know, and stuff. Because I know, I've been coming for a long time. I just need to be reminded. You know, and as it turns out, I don't see that kid for a couple of days because of my work schedule and his drug schedule. And uh, he comes in two days later with the driver's license, and he says, Mom, what do you do when you find a driver's license? Well, I don't tell him what I do when I find a driver's license. Because it's a very bad example, you know. Somebody who's working the steps, working the program. And like I said, it was a ride for that kid. He got, he, Earl turned himself into AA when he was 36 years old. And... Um, and I am so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, yet again, you know, for that happening. But I want to tell you, from, from, from 12 to 36, boy, it was a roller coaster. But what I learned in al what my sponsor kept pounding into me, unconditional love. She made me look up unconditional. You know what it says? No conditions. That's it. <laughs> That's what it's all about, because the truth is, one more time, Al-Anon shines the light of truth on it. I love this kid, and there's nothing he's ever going to do that's going to make me not love him. But I cannot fix him. If love could fix alcoholics, let me tell you, we wouldn't, none of us need to be here. It's not the way it is, you know, and so I'm grateful. And, um,
And you know, and when Earl got sober, I want you to know Earl didn't get sober because you know his mom is in Al Anon, his dad's in AA. He's been going to AA since he's freaking three years old. You know what he told me what he learned in AA, Mom? When I was going to AA as a kid, I learned how to fly under the radar, boy. I learned what to do not to get caught. Because you will hear in AA and exactly what you'll hear in Al Anon, what you want to hear. You know, and that's that that's all he learned when he was doing that. You know, and when he turned himself into AA, he did, he did so because of one thing and one thing only. You know, we say, but for, the, but for the grace of God, I believe it's but for the acceptance of God's grace. My son got sober because as, you know, as was spoken about, that window opened, that window of grace, and he walked through it and you were there for him. And I am so, so grateful for that. So grateful for that. You know, and our life has just been this absolutely, you know, I mean, there's, there's ups and downs. We have a grandson. Um, he's 16 years old now when he was born. I mean, just the absolute apple of my eye. I was so excited to be a grandma. I can't even tell you I've never been a grandma. I consider grandma a big do-over. You know, because this crap that went on with my kids and the things that I did, I am not proud of. Sober people hitting, beating my children because that's what I learned to do. I was nine years now and on the last time I hit my children. You know, and I'm not proud of that, but it's, it's a process that you just have to do to get here. But you have to be willing to look at what you're doing and not pretending because you don't want anybody else to know this crap is going on. Pain is real, you know. The things that we do, you know, you have to constantly be on top of those kinds of things and you have to be accountable to someone. You know, and that's where prayer and, and sponsorship and all of that stuff will walk you through the things you think you can never, ever talk about. Because when I'm honest about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, then then something can happen. But until I come clean with that stuff that's going on with my life, I'm gonna live the same miserable life that I have over and over again. So I'm just gonna end with my grandma's story because uh, you know, when my grandson was born, I didn't know I was gonna be a grandma. I'm real excited. I may start making rules and regulations about grandma right away. The list is on there. Number one in the list is I must be there when the baby's born. I don't know why, it just goes on the list. It's important, you know, and stuff like that. It turns out, you know, and you know what, they got a popsicle stick, they know right away when the baby's coming now, you know, so baby's gonna be born in May. And I have all these commitments just prior to the due date, four of them in a row. And so I tell my, you know, so my husband says to me, well, if you're going to be there when the baby's born, then you might want to get out of these commitments now. Now, let me tell you, when the alcoholic is the voice of reason in your house, you are in big trouble, okay? You don't even know what kind of trouble you're in, but you're in big trouble. But I am like, I'm not going to get out of those commitments. Those are Al-Anon commitments. I'm honoring those commitments. And then my husband says, well, you, you might have to accept the fact you're not going to be here when the baby's born. No, I, I'm going to be here when the baby's going to be born. And he goes, well, then you might want to talk to your sponsor about that. Well, I'm not talking to my sponsor about it, you know, because as Scott Redman always used to say, it's, you know, sponsors are plan busters, okay? They are. Trust me. No matter how good it is, no matter how much sense it makes, they will poke holes in your plan. And so I don't tell my sponsor, you know, and I can't tell my home group because they'll rat me out to my sponsor, any good home group would. And so, but I go right to God because I am tight with God. I am, you know, I have this relationship with a God that's just a whole nother talk. But um, I am tight with God and I remember going to God, you know, and I know we don't pray for specifics and I never do. I always ask when Bill was going through his thing, you know, and not that Bill lived, but that you give Bill and Karen the strength they need to walk through whatever it is that they need to walk through and that you give me the strength to be as good as a friend as I can be through this whole ordeal. But when I go to God about the baby, I'm like, okay, God, I know I'm not supposed to pray about specific things, and you know I never do. But I'm not asking for shoes or a car or a job. I'm asking about a baby just not being born on the weekend when I'm out of town. And I remember seeing God's, God's face as clear as a bell nodding his head, you know. It was like, you know, yes, Larsen, you are of service. I will grant you this wish, you know, and, uh, and that's how it's going down. Because God's, you know, I'm his special agent. He's going to cut me a little slack here. And uh, so anyway, so I do all my commitments. Last commitment, I call my daughter-in-law Friday morning before I get on a plane. Not a twinge. First baby. Yeah, I'm, I'm gold, you know. And so I get on the plane, and, it, and, we, and, and it's this little town in Minnesota, one plane in, one plane out every day. And, and I'm at this dinner, and my cell phone rings. It's Butch on the phone, and the baby has been born. Boy, I am pissed. I am so angry. I just, I'm telling Butch, don't you touch that baby. Nobody looks at that baby. You know, I am just like insane. And, uh, and I'm at this conference, and they're all, oh, we're so happy to have you. And I'm like, I hate you, people, you know. <laughs> Of course, that doesn't come out. That's what's inside. The outside says, yeah, 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 you know. And I go out because I have tools. I call my sponsor. I start screaming at Carol. I, got, I hate Alan on this sucks. When do you get to be there for your family? I ask God for one little bitty baby not to be born on the weekend. Do I get it? No. 
And I'll never forget, I'm in so much pain, and Carol goes, I'll have to call you back. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, you know. Good God, I'm like 20-something years in the program at this point. And it's like, and I'll never forget, I'm so angry, and then almost instantaneously, my cell phone rings again. And it is, it is Carol's sponsor, Charlotte. Now, I'm not sure how it is in Tennessee, but I'm going to tell you in Southern California, when your sponsor sponsor calls you, you have crossed the line, boy. <laughs> They're bringing in the big guns to reel your ass back in. And, uh, and I know better than to yell at her. I go the other way. I start crying, oh, the baby, I really want to be there when the baby's born. When do you get to be there for your family? This sucks. And I'll never forget Charlotte's sweet voice. You know, Larsine, did you turn your life and your will over to the care of God today? You know, and this one thing that I have done faithfully since I have been Alan on every single solitary day is turn my will and my life over to the care of God. Because I know how much I can mess it up with my own thoughts because I want what I want like I want it. But I'm here to tell you no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how busy you are, I don't give a crap what's going on. You can turn your will and your life over to the care of God in 2.3 seconds. God, I turn my life over to you. Done. It's that freaking simple. And I do it every single solitary day. And when I told her that I had, she says, then you are exactly where you were supposed to be, doing exactly what you were supposed to be doing. And you know what, Larsen? You weren't the baby being born today. You weren't the person giving birth. In reality, the truth is, it's a beautiful thing happened to you today. You became a grandma. And because you made some stupid rule in that stupid head of yours about how it's supposed to go down, you're going to take this beautiful event and turn it into a piece of crap? Never mind. <laughs> Just need to be reminded, you know? That's why we have to keep coming back, because this crap is always landing here, giving me bogus information that I want to judge and hate you and do all that, because I am hardwired for that. So it's important I keep coming. This is what's going on. You show me what the truth is. I get the shot at a good life. You know, that kid is 16 years old today. I got a granddaughter. She was born on a Wednesday. Thank you very much. And uh, you will get what you want. You know, and that grandson ended up, you know, when he was 12 years old, he's got diagnosed with Frederick's ataxia. And, and he's losing his ability to walk. He's in a wheelchair now. He's a sophomore in school. It's a big genetic thing, and it's a bunch of puck. And boy, I had a lot of fights with God about that, because it's not right. I don't want anything wrong to happen to this kid. I love him so much. But in reality, if I'm really honest and I go to this with my sponsor, what it really comes down to is how is it going to affect me? I'm so afraid of how it's going to affect me. When in reality, unconditional love. Because you want to know the truth about my grandson. He's perfect just the way he stands. Everybody is just perfect just the way we stand. And now and now we learn to love people just the way they stand. You know, in our closing, we say, let there be no gossip or criticism of one another. Instead, let the understanding, love, and peace of the program grow in you one time. I hope that for all of you with all of my heart. Thanks so much for having me.